Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Providence College. This is a lecture on David Schweikert's After Capitalism, particularly looking at Chapter 3, which discusses economic democracy. This is a fourth lecture in this series. I have lectures on Chapters 1 and 2 as well, and we'll be continuing those lectures afterwards for you to view uh, on this important work. In Chapter 3, uh, Schweikert talks about the basic model of economic democracy. He also discusses the viability of economic democracy, considers what the public sector would look like, and uh, offers an expanded model uh, to discuss as well, and uh, distinguishes between fair trade and free trade. And we will touch on each of those in this video lecture. Uh, one thing we will not talk about is the Mondragon experiment, uh, which uh, Schweikert talks about in his book, uh, we are not talking about this because it provides uh, basic defense for his viability of economic democracy, and that's something that uh, I feel the reader can look at uh, on his or her own. Uh, it's important work there, uh, but this is providing just an overview of the idea of economic democracy as developed by Schweikert in this chapter. Economic democracy has three features to it then, worker self-management, the market, and social control of investment. Now, if you recall from uh, the second lecture, uh, capitalism also had three features, the private ownership of the means of production, the market, and wage labor. So in this case, uh, economic democracy shares one feature with capitalism, and that is the market. Private ownership of the means of production is replaced by worker self-management, which we will talk about a little bit. Uh, we will also talk about the market, and then uh, wage labor, uh, is replaced with uh, worker self-management, and investment is taken over by self-control, uh, uh, social control of investment rather than capital control. Uh, so we want to talk about each of these in turn. Now when we look at worker self-management, uh, we see that the workers are uh, in charge of the productive enterprise, whatever that might be. So a factory for making uh, ugly sweaters, for instance, is going to be controlled by the workers, just as a factory for making pumpkin pies uh, will also be controlled by the workers. Now, there are decisions that need to be made uh, in every worker cooperative, and those decisions will be shared uh, democratically by the workers. That does not mean, of course, that the proceeds from their uh, enterprise will be distributed equally. The workers themselves will have to determine uh, how those proceeds will be distributed, and there will be many issues that might come into play in uh, making an analysis of that distribution, including the needs of the various workers, uh, as well as the uh, contributions, the seniority, and other concerns might come into play uh, for those working in um, the enterprise. What's most important here, though, is that these decisions are made democratically by the workers. Now, in some cases, if a firm is large enough, if it has a significant enough size, the workers might delegate authority for decision-making to uh, management. Now, here there has to be a balance between uh, the autonomy that the manager has to make decisions and the accountability of the manager to the workers. Uh, we have to balance out the ability of the manager to make a decision uh, necessary uh, without limiting that ability to make those decisions, while also holding the manager accountable to the workers for the decisions that the uh, manager makes. Uh, this is one area in which I would suggest that managers must come from the workers themselves. They should not be hired from outside the firm. They should be familiar with, if not practitioners of, uh, the work done within uh, the enterprise. Uh, that's something that Schweikert does not discuss in his book, as far as I can tell, but I think it would be central to any kind of uh, democratic enterprise uh, of workers. It is also important to note that the workers do not own the means of production here, right? These means of production, the factory for the ugly sweaters, the factory tools, machines, uh, the farm, uh, the pumpkin farm for the uh, pumpkin pies, these are owned collectively by society. Okay, and the workers lease these uh, items, these means of production, uh, in order to create uh, the items that they do and make the uh, proceeds that they do. Society gets a return on this property 
uh, through attacks on the capital assets, which go into uh, the investment fund for society, which we will talk about in a minute. Uh, workers also must preserve the value of the capital stock. Of course, they can't destroy what it is that is given to them. Uh, they have to preserve that value and uh, keep it for uh, society in general. With worker self-management, we see much more of a community build up, solidarity among workers rather than competition between individuals for work. And this is an excellent feature of worker self-management enterprises. The second feature of economic democracy is, of course, the market. And a market is the way that we allocate uh, consumer and capital goods. Uh, we trade them uh, in the market uh, using supply and demand to help uh, set prices uh, for those goods. Okay, What the enterprise is trying to do is to maximize the difference between total sales and total costs, uh, just as enterprises do uh, within a capitalist system. However, under capitalism, labor is considered a cost, right? So the capitalist thinks of labor as cost and tries to cut it as much as possible. Uh, under the uh, economic democracy system, the labor is not a cost, but a residual claimant on the proceeds. In other words, uh, the, the enterprise is not going to be interested in cutting the cost of labor as much as possible, but rather in cutting other costs uh, in order that labor can benefit from the work that they do. Now, Schweikert makes a good defense for the idea that supply and demand is necessary to determine production and marketing methods, methods and to motivate uh, society to be, I'm sorry, to motivate the enterprises to be efficient with the uh, tools they give them. I think this is an interesting idea here, and certainly competition uh, through supply and demand can uh, add to these things. I wonder if there might be other uh, ways to make sure that uh, the company is efficient in the use of their tools. Uh, I don't think that human beings are born with the idea that we're just going to uh, use things inefficiently. Uh, if we were, then uh, it would be much more difficult to see how society would arise in the first place. However, supply and demand could be one tool that would be used in a market system uh, within economic democracy uh, to maximize efficiency. Finally, the third feature is social control of investment. Now, we talked about investment in uh, earlier lectures here, and investment typically comes from the capitalist, and the capitalist is motivated to invest in order to earn a profit uh, on uh, his or her investment. Schweikert argues, and I think uh, relatively well, that any society that wishes to be technologically and economically dynamic must in fact devote resources to developing and implementing new technologies and expanding production of goods and services in high demands. In other words, we're all going to be interested in uh, some form of investment. And so the question is, how do we make that investment? And Schweikert's idea here is that there is a flat tax on the capital assets of any enterprise. This tax get paid, gets paid into the investment funds for society. These investment funds are distributed to a variety of regions within the society. Uh, and these regions distribute these funds to the community banks, which distribute them to firms that want to grow or new firms that appear in the society. So the allocation back into the economy is a public event, not a private decision making. Uh, and the fair share is defined, uh, defined prima facie uh, per capita. Now there might be other issues here. Maybe one uh, area or region is economically depressed, and so we put more um, uh, of those funds into that system, uh, into that area. Uh, but the prima facie idea is that it's a uh, per capita investment. And finally, uh, banks in the system are not uh, private either. Okay. So those are the three features of economic democracy. We want to talk a little bit about the viability of this uh, economic democracy. Uh, and uh, uh, Schweikert makes a good case for the idea that some uh, communist, or, sorry, socialist uh, societies have in fact uh, succeeded in the past. Uh, and he thinks particularly of China, Vietnam, and Cuba. Of course, the biggest uh, society that we can think of is Russia, uh, or the Soviet Union, and its failures. But Schweikert makes a case that in fact it did not fail as poorly as uh, history uh, seems to think it did. There was a tremendous growth in technology 
uh, during the Soviet era, uh, which allowed uh, the Soviet Union to be a competitor with uh, what can arguably be the greatest market on Earth, uh, the United States at the time. We also have to recognize that the Yugoslav experiment uh, led to three decades of growth. Uh, and finally, that it is despite the U.S. blockade against it that Cuba continues to succeed and meet standards of health and uh, happiness that the United States uh, cannot meet. Uh, economic democracy is going to be a com competitive, democracy, uh, competitive economy unlike the USSR. So this retains the incentive structure of capitalism, which adds to uh, the viability of economic democracy. Uh, one can ask whether ordinary people are competent enough to elect their bosses. That seems to be a strange question, though, since we were talking about uh, uh, people that elect their leaders democratically anyway. Uh, so if we're going to question that, we could question uh, the whole structure of democratic society. And to return back to uh, the failure of the Yugoslav experiment, uh, Schweikert refers to Harold Lydell, who is a famous uh, uh, capitalist and who criticized Yugoslavia, but he, but he did not think that the failure of Yugoslavia was due to the economic uh, democracy of the workers. Uh, rather, he says that what was needed was more freedom for independent decision-making by genuinely self genuinely self-managed enterprises within a free market. So it seems like historical evidence suggests that uh, economic democracy is viable. Uh, regarding social control of investment, however, we have no historical uh, evidence really to go with here, uh, so we have to kind of make some theoretical projections. There are, uh, Schweikert says, four consequences that might favor social control of investment, investment over capitalism. First, uh, national development will be more harmonious because uh, different regions will not be competing with each other over this investment. Uh, communities will be more stable. There won't be uh, jobs leaving and, and go, uh, coming uh, as there is in uh, capitalist systems. Community life will be richer because the investment goes back into the community. And there will be less worry about capital flight uh, because the capital always comes back into the community rather than leaving uh, and going to a different region or even a different uh, country. Well, what about the pu public sector under uh, economic democracy? How do we take care of uh, other public issues like education and health care and child care? And here, uh, Schweikert relies on the notion of solidarity, which will be built up in a worker-owned cooperative, uh, and this leads to intergenerational solidarity, which will include uh, free parenting and child-rearing classes, equality day care, and quality primary and secondary education, and will allow a pay-as-you-go social security for uh, the elder elderly in that society. The expanded model uh, that Schweikert proposes includes, includes government as an employer of last resort, cooperative savings and loan, and some private ownership of the means of production and some wage labor. Uh, I just want to focus on the government of employer uh, of last resort. If we have a genuine, genuine right to work, then that right means that someone has a duty to provide those jobs. And within a democratically controlled government and democratically controlled uh, worker cooperatives, the duty is to the government and to the people to provide those jobs. This is often a primary argument uh, that I hear from capitalists uh, about trying socialism. Uh, they ask who is supposed to supply the jobs, and of course it is the community that has to supply the jobs. That is an ethical uh, imperative of any society, but particularly of a society of economic democracy. Finally, uh, Schweikert makes a distinction between fair trade and free trade, where free trade is regulated by supply and demand and thus allows lower wages in other countries to eliminate jobs and, and increase profits in the primary country. Fair trade balances this out with a variety of taxes uh, that does not lead to protectionism, but does protect jobs and does uh, aim to help those who are less well off in other societies. Those are the main features of economic democracy as Schweikert discusses them in chapter three. And I thank you for uh, listening.